so much for tuning in today. We've got such a great show. We hope that you like, comment, and share this. Folks, as you know, transgender interventions for kids is one of the hottest topics right now in America, and we've been talking about it here on this show. Today, we're talking with someone who actually has lived experience with transgender identity, but I will let her tell her story. Her name is Erin Brewer, and she's the co-founder of Advocates Protecting Children. As the name suggests, she actively works to defend kids against the dangerous transgender agenda. We're honored to have her with us today. Welcome on Erin. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, let's start with this start here because there's there's still some discussion about even what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So let's start with a quick definition. Can you bring our audience up to speed on what gender dysphoria actually is? Well, gender dysphoria is a feeling as if you are born in the wrong body, a great discomfort with the sex that you are, and a desire to, or even a belief that you are the opposite sex. In essence, it's a dissociative disorder, trying to kind of kill who you are to become a new person, oftentimes as a result of an underlying issue, such as a sexual assault or um, a divorce in the family, feeling like your particular sex isn't as good as the other sex, or some shame surrounding who you are. It's just this this um, you know overwhelming feeling of just wanting to get out of yourself and become a new person. That is a fascinating, fascinating definition, and, and, and that's very enlightening uh, uh, for those of us because that that that's one of the most encouraging things for I think our audience to know. What Aaron just said is. It's a manifestation of a problem that we all have in our lives, of where we're dealing with our own internal problems, fear, guilt, shame, anger, things like that, and we're looking for a solution. Is that pretty much what you said? And, and this is yes. just and I, one I expression of that. Other people might choose sex. They might choose drugs or gambling or lying, you know, to whatever their problem is to get out of. And, and, and you... That that's something. Let me just transition. The next question is: So, tell us about your story. You you actually have experience with gender dysphoria. Tell us about how that how you went through that. Yeah, well, and it's interesting because according to transgender rights activists, any any child who's insistent, consistent, and persistent that they're the opposite sex qualifies as being transgender, and they will offer medical interventions to that child. So based on that definition, I was a transgender child, even though when I was little, um, nobody suggested that I was actually born in the wrong body. Um, between kindergarten and first grade, I had a serious sexual assault when I was with my brother and I was assaulted and he was not. And immediately following that assault, I decided I wasn't going to be a girl anymore. And it was subconscious. It wasn't something that I, you know, um, logically thought out. It was an emotional response to a very traumatic situation. So when I started first grade, I insisted that I was a boy. I wanted to go into the boys' bathroom. I wanted the teachers to call me by the boy's name I had chosen. Um, I became very physically aggressive because I thought that's what it meant to be a boy to the point where my teacher was so concerned that she sent me to the school psychologist for a second. Assessment. And I'm ever so grateful that she did that because I was very troubled and I was essentially trying to kill that little girl who had been so hurt and recreate myself in a way that I thought would keep myself safe from that ever happening again. And if I had been encouraged to accept the idea that I actually was a boy, I never would have had the opportunity to process the trauma. And I actually would have been put in a situation where I would have likely been an easier victim to future your sexual assaults by going into boys' bathrooms, lockers, and showers. And so I'm, I'm incredibly thankful that the school psychologist recognized that I was troubled and um, basically gave my teachers and my parents some ideas to work with me. Um, I was put in a group of, of kids who had communication problems. And so that helped me to learn to talk about my feelings and to talk about my frustrations and um, not to engage in self-harming behavior. Because one of the other things that I was doing is I had so much anger and rage against my female body that I was doing a lot of self-harm. I would take rocks and I would just, I would pound my um, private area because I was so angry that, that something had happened. And I, I focused on, and the area where it happened. Um, and so I was very troubled and I needed help. Um, they encouraged my parents to find positive 
female role models for me so that I could learn that you could be a strong woman and that being a girl didn't necessarily mean I was going to be a victim for the rest of my life. All of those things helped me to understand that that I was um, actually a girl. And it took a while. It's not like um, I went into therapy and immediately had everything resolved, but I learned how to manage the difficult feelings that I have and ultimately to, to very much embrace myself as a woman when I had my daughter and um, they put me, they put my daughter in, in my arms and I just thought, I am so thankful for being a woman because if I weren't, I wouldn't have this beautiful baby. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about fighting for these kids is that if children are medically transitioned, oftentimes they're permanently sterilized. They'll never have the opportunity to grow up and learn what it is like to be a man or a woman. This is uh, already one of the most powerful interviews I've done. <laughs> Thank you for your vulnerability and sharing what, what you just did with our audience, uh, Aaron. It takes so much to be able to do this, but it there's a lot of people out there that are listening to us today that are hurting, you know, and, and there's a lot of people that actually, you know, have come to the same conclusions you did yeah. as, as a young uh, uh, girl, you know, that, that I need to fix this. It's about life preservation. It's about, uh, um, Hey, we're, we're human beings. We have a self-preservation thing that God put in us. good. Thank God we have that. And you're trying to fix it the best way you could right now. And you're met with, it sounds like support and love and, and um, at your school and from your family and others that genuinely wanted to help you, you know, is, is that, your assessment of what you um, experienced at the time was help? Very much so. I am just incredibly grateful to the school psychologist, to my teacher for recognizing that I was troubled. I can't even imagine if they had told me that I was, in fact, a boy born in a girl's body, which is what would happen today. And actually, one of the reasons that I got involved in this, I never thought that I would um, speak out about this. It's it's really hard to, to speak publicly about a trauma like that. It's really hard to speak about basically having a serious mental illness when I was a child. But I, um, when I started hearing about therapy bans, which are bans that prohibit the very therapy that I got as a child that helped me resolve my gender dysphoria, I felt like I was called to share my story and help people to understand that this is a dissociative disorder, that this is something that people can overcome and that we're doing huge disservice to children by telling them that they're born in the, the wrong body, that they're inherently flawed. And the only way that they can survive their difficult feelings is to become somebody else. To me, that just, um, it's an unconscionable approach to this. And so I feel like um, it's everybody who, who hears this, I hope will speak out and say, these therapy bans are horrific because they're, they're, they're capturing children and they're telling them that they have to go through this medical transition rather than working to resolve those very difficult underlying feelings. Wow. That is so powerful. And um, folks, if, if you're listening at home, you're watching this on Facebook, YouTube, wherever you watch, we want to encourage you to share and comment on this. We're with Erin Brewer. Uh, she is the uh, leader of Advocates Protecting Children, and uh, she has a lived experience with uh, going in the direction of transitioning uh, from uh, a girl to a boy. And, and before uh, she made a decision that she wanted to live her life uh, as she was born as a woman, she's gone on to uh, have her own daughter. And, and she's uh, uh, expressing her concerns with us today that for people that go through you know, nobody goes through the exact same thing, but go, but 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 many people, myself included, going through trauma, making choices. Uh, you know, I I was uh, made my choices when I was you know seventh grade. You know, and do, doing different things. Um, it, 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 folks, it's it's how do we help? And and we're trying to talk about that today. And we're talking with one of the leaders in this, using her experience, strength, and hope. Experience, strength, and hope for the benefit of other people at a very important time in our country. And, and she is talking about what this is like. So tell us about what your organization does now. You're an advocate for protecting children. Can you share with us, you know, your audience of what that work looks like today? 
Sure. There's there's kind of a couple of different things that we do. First, we create resources for people. Um, we have a number of books to help parents and educators and policymakers to understand the transgender ideology. So often people don't understand what they're supporting when they support transgender ideology. They they genuinely think that these children are born in the wrong body and that and the medicine can set that right. And that's a horrible deception that we're trying to um, reveal to as many people as we can, because most people, once they realize what's actually happening to children, that they're that they're develop they're they're being induced developmental delays with puberty blockers, um, basically retarding their growth and development. Cross sex hormones cause permanent infertility when they're paired with the puberty blockers, and then the surgery caused permanent damage. All of these are just um, incredibly invasive approaches to what is essentially a mental health issue. And so, so we've created a lot of resources. We have a website, um, www.advocatesprotectingchildren.org, where we have lots of resources. And then I've also been doing a lot of um, legislative hearing, testifying at legislative hearings. So often people don't hear the stories like mine and others who have struggled with gender dysphoria. All they hear are the trans rights activists saying, if you don't do this, um, these children are going to kill themselves, which is a, it's, it's a lie. And it's also uh, promulgating a myth about suicide um, in a way that is very irresponsible. We know that suicide can be a social contagion. And so when they talk about suicide the way they do, they're actually um, potentially increasing the risk of suicide by telling children that the only way to survive is through these medical interventions. And that's just not true. And so um, I go to um, different places and try to tell my story just so people can understand what's really going on. Um, the other thing that I do is interview detransitioners and other people who have been harmed by the transgender industry. And that's been one of the more interesting experiences because um, as I started interviewing others who had experienced gender dysphoria, many of whom went through a medical transition, I found a lot of common threads that I didn't realize were there. Um, many of us have learning disabilities. Many of us didn't have strong adult role models in our lives. Many of us had sexual trauma. Um, there were these um, common factors that seemed to predispose um, someone towards adopting a gender dysphoria as the coping mechanism, as opposed to one of the other co coping mechanisms you mentioned at the beginning of the show. Right. So um, real quick definitions for our audience. There's detransitioners and there's desisters, right? Tell, tell our audience what that means. Okay. So the difference um, is that uh, someone who is a desister, so I'm considered a desister because I didn't medically transition. Although um, increasingly, uh, Healthcare providers are recognizing that a social transition is, in fact, a medical intervention. So we need to keep that in mind, that even affirming someone and allowing them to socially transition is a medical intervention. And it can cause irreversible harm because it sets them on the path now towards medicalization. But typically, a desister is someone who has not had um, intrusive, invasive medical interventions, such as puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgery. Whereas a detransitioner is someone who's had some of the, some or all of those interventions. Right. Okay. So folks understand that, you know, there, there, there's different, there's different things uh, that are going on and we want to get our words right. So um, you are out there and, and I've learned this in the addiction circles too. I, I say we're like toy story, right? Mm -hmm. you, you go into an addiction room and we're all talking very freely and honestly with each other. And then a normal person comes in and every, <laughs> all the toys flop, right? Because we, we can't let them hear how we actually talk to each other in our recovery. So you, you're doing a similar thing here, right? You're bringing together uh, what we've just defined detransitioners, people that are, are going back from a medical decision, drugs and surgeries, and these sisters that just modeled their life, you know, uh, um, after the other gender. And, and uh, you're, you're working in collecting stories. Um, what are some of the common threads from those stories? What would what, what our audience know that for those folks that are being told you literally from our government, you you made a decision when you're whatever, seven years old, 13, 26, you're stuck, which I don't know that that exists anywhere else in America. I'm allowed to lose weight, gain weight. I can get hair transplants. I could shave my head bald, but apparently you detransitioners and desisters can't 
in, in, in your collecting story. So what, what are people saying about this, this moment in America right now? Is it, is it anger, fear, hope? Like what, what's going on? Well, it's interesting because something that you said reminded me that um, when I first started speaking out, I had a lot of trans right activists tell me that I wasn't really transgender, so I didn't have a right to talk about this. And I would say exactly. And that's that's exactly the point is that there are no transgender kids. Kids are there's no such thing really as a transgender child. A child who has gender dysphoria is is someone who needs help, who needs support, who needs assistance. It does not mean that they are this identity that has now become um, so commonly used. And so um, I, I often say, you know, either either. Um, they will say, you know, once a child announces a trans identity, as you said, it's permanent. That's who they are. And you can't deny that. You can't question it. And yet these detransitioners I talked to are just feeling so incredibly betrayed because nobody challenged their idea. Nobody suggested that there might be underlying causes. Nobody suggested that they could get help so that they wouldn't undergo these incredibly damaging medical interventions. And they feel incredibly betrayed. They feel like they can't trust any Anybody. Um, oftentimes they're they're struggling with the, and the mental health issues that they had prior to going through these medical interventions, but now they also have um, medical complications from those interventions that they have to deal with. And a lot of them are lifelong medical patients as a result of this, which has emotional and financial consequences for them. They're just feeling incredibly let down by society and wondering, how could you have let me do this, especially those who went through pediatric transition? So I've talked to a number of children, of people who were children, um, 13, 14, 15 years old, when they started these medical interventions and they look back and they say, how could you, how could you possibly have allowed me to do this? How could you have not looked into the other issues? So many of these uh, detransitioners came in and they already had depression or anxiety, were struggling with autism. These are all really common um, among those who, who announce a transgender identity and are completely overlooked. And instead that transgender identity is affirmed and encouraged and often celebrated when they announce it. Wow. So what, what can we be do that, that, <laughs> I just want to say, I believe everything that you just said, because I've seen what you just said, not only anecdotally, but at such a volume in our country. Um, as I said, if you just just take out the issue and, 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 and put another issue on there. Um, did you know that California, New York and New Jersey are saying that your knee replacement surgeries or the installation of a pacemaker, uh, you can't sue the doctor, you know, for that? You know, people would say, that doesn't sound right. You know, like, I don't understand what you're, you know, like it doesn't compute, right? So, so we're off into this, whatever it is, politics, crazy, idiot, you know, it, where people aren't able to have a conversation. You're bringing common sense back. You're bringing practical stuff, experiential living back. And you're saying we need help. So what what I'd like to do in our audience, if you're not motivated, so, so much of our audience, Aaron, by the way, I'm with Aaron Brewer. Uh, um, she is um, just this wonderful leader who stood up to so much abuse, but she's using her experience, strength, and hope for the benefit of other people. She's been through a lot. She's lived through uh, sexual abuse. She she uh, uh, went and, and lived her life. Um, uh, she was born as a, a uh, girl, and, and she thought uh, living as a boy would solve some problems. She had the benefit of having love and support. She's gone back, uh, living as, a, as she's a mom uh, to her own daughter. And, and, and folks, if this doesn't catch you up to what we're talking about here, I'm, I'm going to dial it in right here. Everybody counts. God's never made a throwaway person. Not me, not Aaron, not any of you. You matter. We've all gone through stuff. And we're, we got to meet people with help. Like I was met with when I had my own issue, completely unrelated, you know, to what you've experienced, but I'm a human being. So I had my own suite of, you know, stuff. And and, and so is everybody else who's listening to this show. And and you've had to do it there. And, and, and so we're on here, we're trying to pass policy to protect children. We, we call our campaign help, not harm, help, mm -hmm. not harm, because that's what you received is help. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 
not harm. People wanted to be with you all the way through it. We're trying to be, it, it, it's a, it's a hostile environment out there to try to do that. But we're trying to fight for every single person like you, because the difference is which clinic did they go to? Which school are they in? What, what, what awareness that their parents have what's available. So we're, we're all kind of racing together to do this. And what would you tell our audience out there that they can be doing to give them encouragement right now? Because hey, this is a God sized problem. None of us is going to be able to fix this on our own, but we can do stuff today. What are you telling people to give them encouragement right now, how they can help? Well, yeah, I want to go back to something that you said, which was, um, you know, talking about these medical interventions. This is the only time in history that I can think of where um, doctors, therapists, teachers, parents are being encouraged to embrace the most invasive treatment for a mental health issue, rather than starting with um, the least invasive, which is how medicine tends to work. And so as far as helping goes, there's many things people can do. First of all, Recognize that those who are detransitioning, they need love and support. They have been incredibly betrayed by society. Um, recognize those who are identifying as transgender are hurting. Um, these are people who have significant mental health issues. Oftentimes, um, their behavior is defensiveness to protect Un unresolved trauma to protect significant mental health issues. So try to recognize that. Um, I encourage people to go to legislative hearings and testify. Call your congressmen, call your senators, call your representatives and encourage them to support the help not harm legislation. It's so important to have people's voices out there. Even if you're just someone listening to this program and you don't have any experience, legislators want to hear your stories. The other thing is, is to, to talk about this. I can't tell you how many times somebody will message me and say, I really appreciate your speaking out, but I can't because um, I'll get fired or I'll lose friends or, um, you know, there'll be some kind of repercussion. And the fact is, that's true. I have had death threats. I have had significant losses of relationships in my life as a result of speaking out. But if speaking out to protect children isn't worth those sacrifices, sacrifices than what is. So I want to just call, you know, courage calls to courage that you, you kind of become emboldened and recognize that you can change this just by speaking out, just by talking to your friends, just by sharing information about what's happening, just by pushing back against the gender ideology that says that you have to call someone by their pronouns and preferred name. And that we can't, um, we can't recognize this as a mental health issue. This is so profoundly a mental health issue. And by trying to medicalize it, they are um, basically damaging children in an experiment that is unprecedented. Unprecedented for sure. Dangerous for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we're a ministry, as you know. Uh, um, and so I'll use some of our words. <laughs> Jesus said, uh, you'll know it by its fruit. <laughs> you know, uh, when they said like, how do you know something is going the way you want us to boss? And he'll say, you'll know, because it'll either be working or not. And we've just seen so much harm in the countries that went before us on this in Sweden and France and England. We're seeing them come back. It's just heartbreaking that our country isn't learning from those that went before us, that, that we're rejecting science and in, in, in the findings of like, you're talking about the mental health community around the globe and that we seem very much not just disregarding it, but we're trying to do what we're trying to create bad fruit because we're, we're making the mistakes by, by going with children younger and, and, and that um, have less support, right? Cause we're taking the parents out. So, you know, you got to trust government workers now, you know, or whoever they run into on the street, you know, or politicians, you know, and advertisements on TV and social media influencers and, it's just a very difficult time. Erin um, Brewer is with us. Uh, she is a, the co-founder um, and she is, uh, she is helping us. Um, the link to your organization, again, has been posted here. We hope people get involved. We hope that you support uh, um, these great organizations that are sticking up for the least and the lost out there. They do need your help. Uh, it is very difficult environment for them to do the advocacy work that they do. And Erin, I just want to tell you, We'll be praying for you. We're going to be supporting you. We thank you so much for taking the time to share your powerful testimony and suggestions with our audience and know that it's a privilege, privilege, privilege 
for you to share your experience, strength, and hope with our audience. And um, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with us today. Folks, please, please, please check out the links that we posted. Please get involved. Family Policy Alliance needs your support on this right now. This is the leading issue of this year. We're headed to our, whether you like it or not, into a presidential uh, sweepstakes politics. And if people don't talk about these issues, if we don't find out where the presidential candidates are, we're going to end up with somebody um, like Joe Biden, who never talked about it in his campaign, and, and then said about every aspect of our government uh, in support of these dangerous uh, ideological uh, uh, medical interventions. And so there's a lot of work for us to do. Please get involved. Please support. And we will look forward to talking to you real soon on Conversations with Craig. And God bless.